DCS Supercarrier Early Access is almost upon us, and today we'll be taking a look at all it has to offer. Please note that I'm using a press preview build, things may be subject to change, and all that. I'm also limited to only the Hornet, Sukhoi 33, and Supercarrier module in this version. So, we've got a number of new toys to play with, starting with the Arlie Burke, a guided missile destroyer. She's kitted out to the teeth with missiles, and a helipad on the rear. An updated Admiral Kuznetsov model, so we no longer have to use the desperately old version from the lock-on modern air combat era. And of course, the Nimitz-class supercarriers and deck crew, along with the landing signal officer station. Early access starts with the Theodore Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln and George Washington, each with their own unique variations. Jumping right in, I'm pleasantly surprised by the deck crew seeing them run around the deck and performing their jobs. I've found the animations can be a little bit stilted during transitions, but otherwise it's looking really great. And yes, before someone asks, no, you cannot run them over, you cannot blow them over, and they are incorporeal. The crew will automatically get clear of the landing area during recovery. The plane director is an essential addition to getting yourself lined up on the catapult. No more will you be awkwardly guessing or using an external view to guide yourself. This has changed the connection process just a little bit more realistic, requiring you to be connected to the holdback bar to taxi forwards and then to ramp over the shuttle with a little extra power, as guided by the crew. This alone is a huge boost to immersion, which makes launching feel much more like a team effort. As a result, I've never had a crooked catapult shot using this new system so far. It's not 100% perfect, however, the director will not account for static objects, so you will need to be mindful of your own aircraft and those around you as you follow their instructions. Once we've run up the engines, we now need to salute to launch. We do this either with the common radio menu, or a keybind. Unfortunately, the deck crew is just limited to takeoff operations. There is no guidance for startup, or to and from parking, or the arrest of wires. But various additions have been considered for later in early access, and I truly hope they will be expanded on in the future. I would like to see a pushback feature added for players, since we can't properly park without it. Whilst the deck crew work great in the daytime, they're not really equipped just yet for night operations, like in glowing batons. We do get flood and running lights, along with the long range line up system but support for deck operations at night is lacking at release and the AI aircraft do not behave correctly, running their lights on the deck. A lot of the features in the supercarrier are quality of life improvements that DCS sorely needs for its carrier operations, with room for up to 16 parked aircraft spawns on the deck, letting us launch large strike packages, the correct dimensions giving us enough room to sit two Tomcats side by side in the bow catapults, and improved ability to land AI aircraft without frequent mishaps, storing aircraft in the hangar once the deck is filled up. The netcode and motion handling for aircraft movement on deck has reportedly been overhauled, although being pre-release I've no way to test this myself in multiplayer. I have however noticed much less of a sudden sticky feeling that you used to get when you were stopping and starting on the deck versus before. With the press preview build, there is understandably a bit of a performance hit though using the supercarrier. Having all the extra details on the deck, and the crew, and then a bunch of aircraft on top of that starts taking its toll on your computer. And I hope we'll see some optimizations made to reduce that cost, especially for those using VR. Hopping back into our aircraft, we'll take a look at the communications. These are fairly simple and to the point. Each pilot is expected to fly a pattern, and there's plenty to learn if you've not already delved into this. We'll start with a case one, a clear daylight landing. We'll call in that we are inbound. Marshall 309, Marky Mops 131418, Angels 2, State 6.7. 305, Letters Weather is visibility 10 plus mile. Scattered clouds at above 10,000, altimeter is 2, 9 up, 9 up, 3. Case 1 recovery, expected DRC 3, 0, 9 up. Report see me at 10. Doing carrier landings, in my experience, has been one of the most challenging and most rewarding aspects of DCS, and I wouldn't claim I'm terribly good at it, but I do thoroughly enjoy doing it. We'll start skipping ahead to the report in at the 10 mile mark. Three, zero, five. See you at 10. 
Descend and switch over to the tower frequency, which is presently not simulated with all the ATC going through just one radio channel. As we're closing for the overhead break, we're given clearance to start our recovery. Tower, green zero topic. Overhead angels one, state 5.4. We'll check the deck and proceed on to the break. Set up flaps and gear and get ourselves on speed. We turn into the ship and the groove, and the final section of our landing. Finally flying the ball to guide us in on the third arrest of wire. And as you probably noticed, the LSO doesn't give very much instruction on this pass. If your approach isn't nearly as clean, however, After each landing, you're given a simple text message with your grading and mistakes. This can look a little intimidating at first, but quickly becomes second nature if you reference the documentation. The new on-screen meatball is invaluable for flying in VR, where it is very often very difficult just to see the ball on the ship itself, but it's also surprisingly useful on a monitor, because it allows you to keep your field of view wider than you otherwise would. With the new comms, however, we have to manually acknowledge the ball call, and this can lead to more than a few fumbled landings when you reach for your keyboard. I would recommend you do some voice activation software or bind controls to your HOTAS for such a critical stage of your landing so as not to take your hands off your controls. We'll now switch over to a case-free night landing. This is a long journey in darkness following instructions and instruments where it is very easy to get disorientated. I would like to be called out by ATC if I wander off here, but at the moment it would appear that they just assume you're doing the right thing, being unable to call out corrective measures. We also lack the ability to request a repeat of instructions, and the AI aircraft do not appear to make callouts and ATC responses, which leaves it feeling a little bit hollow and inactive when there should really be lots of radio traffic. As we close in, the long range lineup system lights are indispensable here. Visible from a great distance, these lights change colour or blink to indicate deviation from the centre line. Three zero five, up and on. Three zero five, concur, fly low. 
boat. Once again, as we get in close to the boat, we switch over to the ball and fly to our landing. This point in particular is always a bit stressful. These approaches were made with no significant traffic, if, however, there is a lot of aircraft in the area, you can expect to be marshalled into flying around in circles waiting for your turn, and I'm happy to see that the AI play ball with the newer carrier ATC even if they don't communicate with it audibly, and for the most part they do a good job. There is the odd accident between fast and slow aircraft colliding with each other on approach, but generally they're all following case 1 and case 3 patterns correctly stacking up and recovering safely. Back on the deck now we've got the LSO station and I'm sure many people, particularly those in sim squadrons, are eagerly anticipating this feature. It's very bare bones at the moment, you can observe in the LSO station with the black camera, and a second screen showing the queue with aircraft numbers, names, fuel states and sometimes the aircraft location in the pattern, which is a very useful reference. But you cannot interact with anything just yet. Despite its lack of features, I've actually rather enjoyed being on the LSO platform. In particular with VR it's a great spectacle to watch aircraft come in and land, and I'm sure you'll get loads of entertainment trying to take on the role of LSO with your friends in multiplayer. I'm very interested to see how this will evolve into a full position within DCS as the features are developed, however it has one glaring issue right now. The black camera is essentially useless at night. You cannot see the AOA or navigation lights on approaching aircraft, and this is mostly because of a DCS core issue with aircraft lights being too dim, and the lighting system is somewhat uncertain as it has been undergoing a lot of changes lately. At present the LSO platform is not a dedicated player slot, but rather an external ship camera, which I hope will remain available still after a proper LSO role is added, to allow spectating from the LSO's platform as they work. Lastly we have the Admiral Kuznetsov, we're able to use a new model with 9 park spawns for aircraft. In order to take off, now you have to taxi up to the markings and press U to command an extension of the blast shield and chocks, and then gently move forward to rest against them. Once your engines reach full power, they will suddenly retract, allowing you to take off. Whilst this works well and does look really cool, it lacks any in-cockpit guidance and it's very easy to miss the correct position, lacking anyone guiding you in but the supercarrier deck crew. Being a counterpart to the Flaming Cliffs 3 Sukhoi 33 module, I don't know if it will receive the same level of attention as the Nimitz supercarriers. It doesn't feature new comms, deck crew or improvements to the meatball system, and the on-screen guide doesn't show either. Of course, this could all change, but we presently don't have a clear roadmap on what they plan to do with it. So rounding it up then, I can't deny that the supercarrier looks and feels great, it's got a huge potential, many interesting upcoming features like the in-depth LSO, air boss, briefing room and emergency barricade arrestments. It's far less restrictive for mission making and I'm sure we'll see some great missions and campaigns eventually released and built on the super carrier. But as of right now, the press build only featured a few practice missions so you will probably have to get your hands dirty in the editor if you want missions or content, at least until the incredible DCS community fills in the gap. I feel it is in a good state, nothing feels overtly broken so far in my experiences, it's just lacking features. Being early access you'll have to decide if it's for you yourself, I personally would have liked to have seen better support for the night operations on deck at release and more depth in the comms, but we'll have to wait and see how things develop. If you're in a virtual squadron or seriously into naval flight ops, I feel this is a must have addition to DCS. The large number of quality of life upgrades to the sim make it a strong consideration for anyone regularly flying navy aircraft in DCS. Due to release this month, DCS Supercarrier. 
I hope you enjoyed and take care.